All Things Watch the Podcast, where we talk all things movies, television, streaming originals, and so much more. And in this one, we are going to talk about episode 3 of the brand new Marvel Cinematic Project, which is, of course, Secret Invasion. And Secret Invasion is the next chapter of Phase 5 of the MCU. And honestly, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. I, I see that a lot of people online are not... Uh, or at least they don't appear to be enjoying it as much as I am. But honestly, I think it's a really good show. I love that it's a political show. I love that it has a lot of it has a lot of Captain America Winter Soldier vibes, but without all the action. This is a more uh, a more solid, well grounded. Um, I, I won't go as far as saying more solid, but it is a much more well grounded, uh, smaller approach to that film, if that makes sense. Whereas, you know, Captain America: The Winter Soldier was all about Captain America, obviously, and him trying to win back his friend Bucky Burns, while all this, while while at the same time trying to manipulate or trying to maneuver his way through a political uh, coup, so to speak, which was done by Hydra. Well, this one is very similar to that, except rather than uh, Hydra being in control, of course. We now have the aliens known as the uh, the Skrulls, uh, who of course are uh, you know invading uh, Earth, and I really like. And at first, I was very skeptical about this series, anyways, just about considering the fact that in the comics, Secret Invasion is a really big deal. You know, it's an Avengers level threat, whereas here it's a much smaller, like I said, a much smaller, well grounded uh, story, which only really revolves around Nick Fury, and that's pretty well it. And Ben Mendelsohn's character, of course, Talos or Talos, uh, you know tomato tomato i call him talos but some people i believe nick fury in the show calls him talos um but uh you know you know i really liked uh, i really like ben Mendelssohn and his portrayal of that character and i think that uh and i think that this series uh whether you love it or hate it i think it does a really good job at using talos and fury uh to sort of push this story along and all that good stuff but anyways episode three was titled betrayed uh betrayed now this was actually uh from what i can gather pretty well the shortest um uh, the short of, shortest episode of the series, uh, and a lot, but a lot happens in this one, you know, especially towards the end with Gaia and Amelia Clark's character. Obviously, she's portraying Gaia, uh, but you know, uh, you know, where her story is at the end of the series or at the end of this episode, I'm sorry, it really takes a turn in a way that I was not really expecting, but at the same time, I also think there's more going on with her character than what meets the eye, but we'll get into that in a second, and we'll just go ahead with our scene-by-scene -scene breakdown, and then we'll talk about each scene and whatnot. Uh, so this episode actually starts and opens uh, with, of course, the Rebellion Scrolls. Um, oh, sorry, folks. Uh, I usually try to skim along the episode while we're doing these reviews, and it opens uh, with, of course, Gravik and the uh, Rebellion Scrolls, and of course, he's looking at this machine now because he actually wants to become a super scroll. Now, like we said before in the previous episode, I believe it was um, a super scroll in the comics is actually a scroll who, well, for one, it's only a single scroll. Now, I could be wrong about that. It's been a long time since I've read Secret Invasion or done anything with this story. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there was multiple scrolls that were uh, super, but to my, to you know, to my memory right now, just. You know, right now I can think that I can only think of one Super Scroll in the comics, but like I said, there could be perhaps there's dozen of them. But right now, just thinking about it here on the spur of the moment, I believe I can only actually <laughs> recall one Super Scroll. Whereas here in the show, it seems like he's going to want to turn all the scrolls into these Super Scrolls, which of course will end up becoming these, you know, basically unstoppable uh, aliens. Because not only will they, they're already super powered, they're already more powerful than humans, but then they'll have the ability. Uh, the abilities of basically still pretty well the Fantastic Four, even though the Fantastic Four are not in the MCU yet, uh, they're still basically going to have the same similar characters, except rather than having Mr. Fantastic, they'll have Groot, rather than having Pyro, they'll be using Extremis uh, from Iron Man 3, which I thought is actually pretty clever, because it's a great way to tie Iron Man 3 back into the story. Iron Man 3 is one of those movies where it's kind of like, well, you know, what was really the point of it in the greater MCU? Well, now it has a point, because now uh, the scrolls are using extremis as one of their uh you know one of the four abilities that they will have they're also going to have uh the ability of uh that frost god uh or i can't remember his name but he was in thor love and thunder and all that stuff and uh, that's basically how this episode starts anyways is with gravik looking at the machine because he's going to turn himself into a super scroll and he wants to um 
you know, he wants to have these abilities to continue his invasion. Uh, but like I said, in the TV series, it seems like all of the scrolls are going to end up inheriting these powers, and it won't be just one. So I thought that was pretty clever and pretty interesting. Uh, I'm still still very curious to see how they're going to be able to sum up this entire <laughs> storyline in just a few more you know we only have three more episodes left i just don't think that it's even believable that they could get rid of the scrolls at this point in just three short episodes i do think that they could get rid of gravic i do believe that they can beat the rebellion scrolls but i don't think that the threat of the scrolls is I just don't think the threat of the scrolls will ever go away unless they either, uh, you know, come to some form of truce agreement that benefits the scrolls, or if the scrolls actually left the planet. And I just don't see that happening. Uh, I do think that eventually, uh, Gravic, uh, not Gravic, well, yes, Gravic too. I do think Gravic will end up being destroyed. But I also think that Halos or Talos will end up having to make it a sacrifice as well because. You know, I think the humanity needs to see that the scrolls are not all bad and whatnot. Uh, but anyways, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to that when the time comes. Uh, so the story starts with Gravik. He's looking at that machine. He wants to become the Super Scroll. And later on in this episode, we will see that he does become the Super Scroll. Because when Talos confronts him, uh, you know, Talos will end up putting a knife through his hand. And then we will see the extremists actually heal him. But until we get to that point, we have Nick Fury hanging out with his wife. Uh, still not really sure yet if... He knows that she is a scroll. Uh, we're not even still really 100% sure that this is even Nick Fury. Um, I'm still not totally convinced that it is. I think that we've there's very likely multiple versions of Nick Fury in this episode or in this series because I do think there, there's different scrolls uh, playing the character. Um, I do think that in the comics, as far as I can remember, some of the scrolls would actually get so deep into their character uh, and you know into them having to portray a human. That sometimes they would actually forget the fact that they're a scroll and actually continue to live and actually believe that they are human. Now, so it is a possibility that maybe uh, this uh, scroll that's portraying Nick Fury, maybe he really thinks he's Nick Fury, or maybe the other way around, maybe the wife really believes that she's human. I'm not really 100% sure how that's going uh, to go, but it will be interesting to see where it goes. Uh, as the story continues, uh, we also know that uh, his wife, Nick Fury's wife in this episode, ends up getting a phone call and uh, seems like she could still be sort of double-sided. Maybe she's still working with Gravik. Maybe she's trying to stop Gravik. Or um, I'm, I was under the impression, and maybe they did confirm it, and I just missed it. So let me know if they did, because it is possible that I just missed it. But I think they may have even confirmed that she could actually be Gravik's... Um, excuse me, she might actually end up being Gravik's mother or something like that. Uh, so that would be interesting to see that as well. Uh, you know, or at the very least, maybe not like actual biological mother, but maybe more of like a surrogate mother, you know, someone who took him in, took care of him, and really just wanted to, uh, you know, really just wanted to see Gravik be healthy and happy and live the best form of life that he possibly could. Uh, so even if she's not literally his mother, she is sort of like that mother figure, I think. Uh, I could be wrong, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure well, that's the impression that I got from it anyways is that she seems like she's very close to Gravik uh, so then we come to another scene here between Gravik and uh, Gaia and uh, and basically Gravik is starting to figure out really uh, that Gaia is sort of the mole he's starting to figure out that she is you know running to Talos and telling Talos everything that's going on and uh and you know and of course talos is working with fury and gravik is not you know gravik is not a fool he's very organized he knows what he wants he knows or at least seems like he knows how to get what he wants it seems like he has the right players in play so he's very good at uh, playing the game we'll say you know he would be a very good chess player uh in this game of chess that he's playing with trying to take over the world and you know and he obviously knows that gaia is slowly but surely uh, sort of betraying him because of the fact that you know he's telling Gaia things that only her and some other people know so she has this uh, you know intel that most of the other scrolls don't even have and he's starting to pick up on this he's starting to realize hey somebody is you know ratting us out here and I'm pretty sure it's you so uh so her so Gaia and Gravik ends up going to this building and when she when they go to this building she ends up texting the location of the building and then of course of course Talos ends up going uh 
ends up uh, being at that location, but I can't remember if if he's actually at that location because Gaia texts him or if it's just because they have agreed to meet there to begin with. Uh, but either way, they end up meeting, and this is where we see this is where we get the first glimpse uh, of Gravik actually being a super scroll uh, because. Uh, they end up having a feud or this disagreement inside of the diner. And but also, by the way, how crazy was that scene when they were in this uh, restaurant or diner or museum or whatever it was, uh, and Talos actually attacks, gra attacks Gravik, and then all of the humans all around sat down at the tables. They actually get up uh, to help Gravik because they want to protect him, and they all turn into Gravik. They all shape shift and look like him. And I just thought, like, how how cool of a scene was that? You know, it was a really cool scene. They all look like Gravik, and they all use their shape shifting ability. And I just thought it was. It also shows uh, the amount of power and control that Gravik had. You know, he basically controlled everything in that room, at least in terms of the people, uh, sort of exercising his power. I guess. Sort to speak but talos is not afraid uh he's not going to back down he keeps confronting gravik and uh, he keeps telling gravik you know that he's not going to let him uh you know take over this planet he doesn't want he's not going to allow him to actually uh invade the earth and actually fully take over the earth so he's like i said he's not backing down he, which which also shows the character of talos as well uh and i i honestly love seeing ben mendelson on the screen he's one of my favorite actors honestly and uh, i first got introduced to ben mendelson in a netflix original series which i think was called bloodline and he played like sort of this brother that was you know sort of you know just off the rails a little bit and he was he portrayed this brother uh that uh that most of the family didn't like and that was my first time actually seeing ben mendelson uh play in anything and i absolutely loved it i thought his portrayal in there in that uh, series was really good and i've been following his work ever since you know he just recently did a movie with shailene woodley which i think was called to catch a killer that was a really good movie as well so whenever ben mendelson is on screen you know it's, it's always fun watching him act because he's just such a great actor and he you know his his presence is always really well known you know you really feel his presence on the screen when he's when he's there and of course this is once again uh, like i said this is where he ends up putting a knife through gravik's hand and rather than gravik just pulling the knife out he actually rips it out cutting uh the knife literally basically cutting his hand pretty well in half but then he ends up healing with the extremis so this shows shows us uh that he has already become a super scroll which means he already has his abilities now, I would assume that he already has all four of his abilities, and maybe he just didn't want to reveal that yet, uh, or maybe not. Maybe he only has one ability, um, and maybe he needs to, or maybe he needs to figure out how to use the other abilities. Uh, we, we're not really clear about that part of it yet. All we know is that he has entered the machine, and he has become a... Uh, a super scroll and uh and and all that and all that good stuff and then we come to the next scene where we see uh nick fury and talos uh you know once again meeting uh at the bar and talos is having a lunch and once again uh, like i said before i really love their relationship in this series and i love how they're playing off of each other and i think it's very interesting how you know the series does a really good job at making you actually sort of you know see and sort of side with uh with talos because even though he's you know he's one of the scrolls and even though he is you know sort of you know i guess you could say indirectly a part of the invasion of earth you really you can really sort of side with him you really get to feel you know his frustration but at the same time you also get to really feel nick fury's frustration and you really do see how all the world events has changed fury and i just I still think that even in this episode, they're still doing a really good job at showing that back and forth between Talos and Fury because, you know, they're both equally, they're both equally, really, they're both equally suffering and, but, and they're both equally in need and want, you know, Fury wants to save the earth and save the planet and save the humans and Talos just wants a place to live. So, you know, I thought that this scene was really good uh, and I do think that uh, they're very, you know, I do think that their, their their dynamic is just really good. And I love how in this scene as well, Talos, and even all throughout this episode, really, Talos continues to tell Fury, you know, that, 
you know, the only time you ever talk to me is when you're in need. And he literally says that here at this brunch. He, you know, he says, you didn't come in here and ask me how are the eggs. You didn't, you didn't come in here to buy me breakfast. You didn't even come in here to have breakfast with me. You just came in here to ask me for help. And I just thought that that was, well, it's true for one, it's, it's actually really true uh, and really appropriate. And I do feel like that is within the character of Talos, at least in this interpretation of Talos. I do think that, you know, he really would say that to someone like Fury because he is getting frustrated, you know, you know, whether, you know, whether he wants to help Fury or not, you know, he is getting frustrated with the fact that, you know, everything, a lot of Fury's, uh, you know, accomplishments have come from Talos helping him over the past 30 years and going undercover and shape-shifting and becoming these different identities and having these different, uh, you know, faces for the sake of getting intel for Fury. And so I really thought that that conversation there was really appropriate. So, uh, as this episode continues, we end up learning uh, that Gravik actually has another plan in motion where he wants to basically s try and start World War III, which sort of also circles back to the first episode, which was why he let, what, like three bombs or whatever it was go off over in Moscow, Russia. Well, now he has, I think it was like a UN, some form of UN carrier or some form of, maybe it was the United States, some form of bomber or something that's going to go out into these waters and uh, it's going to end up attacking a submarine of a different nationality. So once again, you can see that uh, Gravik has certain people in place and he has these powers and 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 uh, not so much abilities, but he has access to these very high-powered political people. Uh, you know, through either kidnapping them and actually replacing them with scrolls, or by you know simply influence. And uh, and he has everything situated where he can do these massive global events, uh, such as now he's trying to start this nuclear war. He already did it in Russia. And now he's trying to do it here with this carrier and submarine. So. You know, even though, so they're doing a really good job at making the stakes global because, you know, the point is that Gravik is trying to cause and create World War Three, but doing it on a very low budget, um, a very low budget, but also very small, well-contained story. So, you know, that was one concern I had about Secret Invasion and about the Disney doing it as a Disney Plus series, especially for Marvel in the MCU, because... It's just, you know, I just couldn't, <laughs> even now still really, I I'm still can't really wrap my head around the fact that we have a secret invasion with no Avengers, but I do see how they're telling this grand, sort of grandiose tale, but keeping it small, well-grounded, and keeping it really only down between Talos and Nick Fury. So then they end up going, uh, so they end up getting intel and they figure out um, uh, the person that has the code because there's a security code that they need in order to basically abort this mission and to make, um, you know, this mission that Gravik is on, it's already in play. They already have, you know, the, the submarine and this carrier is already about to attack each other. Uh, so, but so, you know, Talos and Fury obviously wants to abort this mission so that, you know, to prevent World War Three. So they end up getting intel and they learn that there's a code. You can only deactivate this, uh, you know, abort this mission with a certain safe code or whatever it is or a secure password, passcode. So they figure out who has it and then they go and infiltrate the white place and they need to... Uh, and they need to try their best to uh, get the code from him by whatever means necessary, really, to prevent this from happening because they need to prevent World War Three. And one thing that this scene really does well is that it really shows how far uh, Nick is really willing to go in order to save the planet because he actually ends up holding uh, the guy's child hostage and he puts a gun to his head and he's basically like, hey, man, like if you don't stop this, I'm going to kill this child. Now, we know that it's a scroll, which is probably why Disney allowed it to happen because technically, even though it's a child, it's also really an alien. So I'm thinking that's why that they got away with doing that on the show is because technically it's not really a human, it's really a scroll uh, and whatnot. But the guy obviously, uh, he, the guy never actually caves, uh, so eventually Talos ends up shooting him, and then Talos is sort of, you know, forced to uh, resort to another, uh, to some other means, and, and to go, you know, to try to figure out another way to get this code. Now, meanwhile, on this submarine, uh, there's already a couple people that don't agree with this mission, uh, so they're already, so, you know, just naturally, some of the people on that sub are trying to sort of fight against this authoritarian figure, but of course, you know, in this type of situation, the ranks obviously overrule, so that guy, you know, the, the, the captain, I guess, or whatever he is, the one calling the shots, 
you know, he overrules the guy that's sort of like, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And then, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And then the, the other guy's like, well, this is our orders. We have no choice. So uh, Talos ends up shooting the guy because he knows that they're just not going to get anywhere with it. So he ends up resorting uh, back to having to use Gaia. So he calls Gaia and says, hey, Gaia, we need you to basically retrieve the memories of whichever captain. And you need to figure out what the code word is before it's too late. And of course, essentially, that's what Gaia does. And I really like that as well. It shows that Gaia is still good. It shows that she is still truly working on the side of, uh, you know, of humanity and on the side of good, uh, which I think is a pretty good transition. It was kind of a quick transition because I do feel like in the first episode, she probably was still pretty rebellious and relatively mean or evil. But I do think that as the story went on, uh, you know, especially after she learned that her mother has passed, then I do think that she is sort of on this redemption, tra uh, you know, trail now, where she is slowly but surely going to come back and start being good. So she ends up figuring out the code by uh, accessing the memories of the person that the scrolls have had have held captive, and uh, and of course she ends up bringing the code back uh, or tells the code to Talos by calling him phone phoning him back and telling him hey this is the code word. So Talos uh, uses his, that ability that he has to transform, and he transforms his voice and he calls the submarine and tells him uh, the code, and then they are able to abort the mission. Uh, so they basically save the day. Uh, basically, and they do it because, and, and thankfully, it's Gaia that's actually really technically the one that saves the day. And then we come pretty well to the very last scene of the of the episode. Well, we see uh, Fury and uh, we see Nick and Talos, of course, sort of having a little bit of a banter again towards the end of it. Uh, but at the same time, once again, you can see both sides. But I did like to see, I did really appreciate the writing with what Talos was saying. Uh, Talos is like, you know, I'm not with Gravik because I'm with you. So I really like that that back and forth that they had, that banter. And uh, I thought it was really appropriate. And I'm actually loving their dynamic. I love Fury. I love Talos. I hope nothing happens to Talos, but I do feel like something will happen to him. And I do think that Gaia will eventually have a bigger role. Uh, so, um, so then we actually go back to Gaia and Gaia is now on the motorcycle. She's just about to escape the compound when she ends up running in to Gravik. Gravik ends up, uh, you know, basically riding towards her. You know, she's just going out the main road. She's on a bike and he's in a vehicle. Gravik gets out of the vehicle because he knows that she is the, uh, the mole and she is the one that betrayed the rebellion scrolls. And then he ends up shooting her. And, of course, that ends up, uh, well, it, they make it appear as if he killed uh, Gaia, but we know she hasn't, uh, she's not dead because she's actually in trailers. If you go back and watch the trailer, she's in scenes and she's going to be in future episodes. And not only that, but in the trailers, there is one scene when she's like surrounded by this white light. So I think that Gaia is already a super scroll. And I think that that's why they probably uh, showed the extremists uh, earlier on when Ben Mendelsohn put the knife, well, not Ben Mendelsohn, but when Talos put the knife through Gravik's hand. Uh, I do think that that was sort of a foreshadow. I do not believe that Gaia is dead here. Uh, I just think that the next episode will start with her uh, healing and whatnot. And uh, and then we and then the show ends up ending with uh, with Fury's wife, and she goes to this locker room. And she ends up opening up uh, this safe and whatnot. And I think when she opens it, it was just a gun. Hang on, I got the scene playing here on my television so I can be reminded of what it is she has. Uh, yeah, so she pulls out a gun. So she has a son locked up, a gun locked up in this uh, safe. So it's hard to know really if she is good or bad. Um, I like to think she's going to be good, but I don't really know that. Uh, she might, I mean, she might not be good. She might end up, it might end up turning out that she's, uh, evil. Uh, I'm really on the fence about her. I'm also still even on, very on the fence about, uh, Fury and whether or not that actually is Nick Fury. Uh, I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But all in all, that's basically everything that happens in episode three. Like I said, it's not a huge episode. Even for a mid-season finale, it wasn't like a huge episode. Not a whole, whole lot happens in this one. Not in terms of the greater, you know, invasion. Not in terms of the greater uh, story of the invasion. It's really just a smaller story where Gravik has his master plan, where he's trying to invoke World War Three, And basically, Talos and Fury, and act honestly, the real hero of this episode is Gaia. And of course, uh, we also know now that Gravik is an actual 
Super Scroll, he's already entered the machine, and now he has uh, at least the powers of Extremis. And we know for, and at least well, I guess we don't know because they never confirmed it in this episode. But I have no doubts in my mind that Gaia is also uh, a Super Scroll now at this point. Uh, so there's only three episodes left. Uh, you know, this is not a whole lot left to the episode. I do suspect that the second half of this series will have a little bit more action, and I do hope that the episodes are a little bit longer. I was a little bit disappointed with how uh, how short this episode was, just because of the fact that I felt like it was such a such a short uh, episode that I just feel like they never really had a chance to explore Secret Invasion as much as I would have liked. I, I feel like I, I kind of wish that they had went a little bit further. Like yes, they needed to stop the attack, and yes, they needed uh, you know Gaia's help and all that stuff. But and they could have ended Gaia's story right where they did with her being shot and everybody wondering you know whether or not she survived. But I do feel like they could have went a little bit further uh, with the overall Secret Invasion story as a whole. They could have showed you know some more people maybe that were you know scrolls like powers and lead uh, uh, leaders in power that are actually scrolls. I think that they could have gave us a little bit more story about uh, Fury's wife. They could have even give us given us a little bit more flashbacks of Fury and Talos and whatnot. And uh, and all that good stuff, but all in all, I still like the uh, I still love the episode. I, but I do think that episode three was probably the weakest episode so far. Uh, but like I said, I was very skeptical about watching this, anyways, because of Disney and Disney Plus. Their series always start strong and then get worse as they go on. And I do feel like this is uh, we might be going into that trend now, where with episode three being the weakest of the two. Uh, I loved the first two episodes. I thought they were perfect, uh, and I still did really like this episode. But I did think it was you know it was. I feel like this episode was much more of a filler episode with the exception of the fact that we now have the Super Scrolls. So I just hope the last three episodes have a ton of uh, action. I hope we get to see a lot more of Fury. I want to. I hope we get to see a lot more about the Scrolls as well. You know, it would be cool if we got a lot more background about the Scrolls and all that good stuff. And uh, and that's pretty well all I got. And, and that's pretty well all this episode had and pretty, pretty well all I got for this episode and for this podcast. I know this one's a lot shorter, but like I said, the episode was a lot shorter too and it had a a lot less happen in it and whatnot but i'm um, looking forward to the, ne to the next episode of secret invasion and i uh, can't wait to see the story as a whole to see how it plays out and all that good stuff and uh really looking forward to seeing if nick is actually nick or if he's actually a sprawl and i'm also very curious to see about his wife to see if she's good or bad and all that good stuff and i can't wait to see gaia like i said i know gaia's not dead gaia is definitely still alive and all that good stuff and, uh, and that's then that's pretty well all i got so if you like this podcast folks click the follow button follow along the podcast if you're listening to this on youtube then click the subscribe button and then hop on over and check out the podcast and all that stuff and now uh, that's all i got for you for this one and until the next one take care